Recording in progress. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. Hi everyone, um, uh, I would like to welcome you all and thank you all for being here today. This is the first day of the Zero Carbon Conference for Students and uh, I'm Kaija Saramäki, I will be the MC for today. Um, we have students from all over the world in this conference um, and we would like to start, start the conference with a movie that has been made by Japanese high school students. Okay, so um, like like it said said in the in the movie that don't you think we need to do something and that is very true we do need to do something and we will have very nice uh, examples of things that students and other people around the world can do uh, for climate climate change. Uh, we will start with the opening remarks from uh, Abe Suichi, the governor of Nagano Prefecture. I am Abe Switch, and I am the governor of Nagano Prefecture. I will make some brief remarks on behalf of the organizers. First off, I appreciate all the efforts of North Karelia and the conference staff in holding the Zero Carbon Conference for students. It is thanks to them that students are able to attend from all around the globe. Nagano Prefecture was the host of the 1998 Winter Olympics and Paralympic Games and is known for this legacy and our many ski resorts. Our land is 80% covered by forest and we cherish the blessings of nature in our everyday life. However, in October, 2019, Super Typhoon Hagibis 
tore through Nagano, causing huge damage. In December that year, we became the first prefecture in Japan to declare a climate emergency. At that time, we also announced our resolution to go zero carbon by 2050. The issue of climate change stretches across regions and generations. It is the responsibility of our generations and of countries that have contributed significantly to greenhouse gases to take immediate action to stop the climate crisis for those who come after. More young people all over the world are raising awareness and acting toward climate change, much like our participants today. They motivate me to do even more. Some attendees at this conference organized the global climate strike in Nagano Prefecture. They have called on their village for a climate emergency declaration and implemented insulation in school rooms. The Zero Carbon Conference is an opportunity for sharing issues and activities beyond countries, regions, and generations. Mutual understanding and connection will create a bigger impact than you can accomplish on your own. You have the power to change society. Let's work on this global issue together and greet brighter tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor, Governor Abe Suichi. Uh, the next uh, opening remarks will be made by uh, Pekka Orpana. He is the ambassador at the Embassy of Finland in Tokyo. Hi, my name is Pekka Orpan and I am the ambassador of Finland in Japan. I'm really happy to say a few opening words uh, in this Zero Carbon Conference and use the opportunity to inspire you. The themes of the conference are extremely important as they very much influence our, the future of our planet and our lives. Climate change is an existential problem that we can still mitigate and circular economy and forest and the use of forest resources are an important part of the tools available. Circular economy is not only recycling waste, with waste, which is of course very important, but circularity can be achieved in many fields. Circularity of bioeconomy, that is the use of forests and other biomass in closed loop, for instance for energy, and, and materials is one of the key elements to reach carbon neutrality. And the key to get rid of microplastics once and for all is simply to get rid of the extensive use of plastics and forest biomass is an answer also to that problem. I love to hike in the forests, pick up berries and mushrooms, Forests have a huge value as a recreational environment for people to enjoy and as a home of biodiversity. We need to preserve forests and biodiversity, but in Finland we have learned that it is possible to do that and use forests also for economic purposes. In fact, sustainable management of forests in Finland already for about 100 years has enabled commercial use of forests in a way that the volume of biomass has, has steadily been increasing in the forests despite uh, of logging. Uh, because of sustainable forests uh, industries we actually have a much bigger carbon sinks than we would have otherwise. You will be talking about uh, these and related issues over the coming few days. 
it is wonderful to see uh, that so many of you are online. The people in power have the responsibility to act now, but the young generation will face the reality in the years to come. And the sooner you will have expertise, innovations and ideas to find good solutions, the better we all will be. Cooperation is of course the key. We cannot solve the wicked problems related to climate change alone. The cooperation of Nagano in Japan and, and, and Northern Karelia in Finland on forest bioeconomy is a wonderful example of a very concrete and effective cooperation which brings all of us together today. Both Finland and Japan are very strong forestry countries and both want to bring together their long experience and know-how to help to find solutions to slow down the climate change. I hope that you will enjoy the conference and that it will help all of you to make a contribution to save the world, nothing less. Thank you very much. Kiitos. Arigato kusaimasta. Thank you to the Ambassador Orbana in, in Tokyo. Next, I will show you uh, how we are going to be using Padlet, which is um, uh, used for discussion part and for questions. So um, you will be receiving this link in, uh, in the chat box. Uh, and also for those in YouTube, it will be there in a few, few moments time. Um, we will have different, different Padlets for each day and the uh, links will be uh, announced uh, at the beginning of each day and also during these sessions. Um, we have for each of the speakers, we have their own section here. So if you have any comments or questions to them, you can write them here. But before you do that, we would like you to log in. So it's at the top here, top right corner, and you can log in with either your Google account, your Microsoft account, or with your Apple account. And in some, some cases, it will, um, it will go through some certain, certain um, procedures, uh, and it might go to the front page of Padlet also, then you can come back with the link that you have and you can see that you are logged in when you have um, an icon here and you don't have the login here. And once you are here, if you want to have some questions or comments for any of the speakers, uh, you can just add a comment here and um, uh, press enter and it will show there. Uh, you can edit and you can delete your own uh, comments, but you cannot edit and delete other people's comments. And I would like to remind you of the basic, um, basic ways of how, how to uh, interact on the internet. Uh, be polite, be constructive, uh, don't be insulting. So uh, you can use this uh, also uh, after the sessions, this will be open. Uh, open uh, all through the day. So, and also the uh, speakers will be uh, coming back to these uh, at some point to reply to some of the questions directly here in Padlet as well. Okay, then we can go to our first uh, presenter. It is Shina Tsuki, environmental activist from Japan. And um, she will talk about the current situation of the earth, um, the generation Z things. Go ahead, Sheena. Hi, can you guys all hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you so much. So I would just share my screen so that everyone can see. Sorry. Just wait a little. Hold on. Um, yes. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. So it's a little 
Now we're outside. It's, it's good. <clears throat> okay, so hi everyone. My name is Sheena Tsuki, it says on the slide. And I am a, 20 for, a 21 years old climate activist. And before I, I start my presentation, I would like to say big, big thank you for just inviting me to this wonderful event. Today, um, I will be talking about my current project and the, the journey it has taken me to get through it. And also, yeah, I talked about the uh, environment as well. So back in my high school, I was in a school, looks like this. Wow. So this is, uh, it, it's called Green School. And when I was 15, I decided to come to Bali by myself to attend this beautiful school. And, and the green school uh, <clears throat> is not only completely made out of bamboo, but aims to educate world green leaders. It's also known as the most sustainable school in the whole world. It has solar panels, hydropower to make sustainable energy and grow organic food and vegetables. It teaches students how to solve problems in society today. And there's no walls between classes. What is most different from Japanese traditional school, which I was in when I was in uh, junior high school, it's that, uh, that you can create your own classes and you can get official credits to graduate with. So what I wanted to do in my own class was to create a sustainable and non-toxic lipstick for my sister. The story of my interest in the environment begins here. It's a little funny face, but uh, my sister is, is on, the, on the left and I'm on the right. So the story is my sister and I went to makeup store to buy some makeup, natural makeup products, uh, because we, we, we knew that she, my sister had a sensitive skin and she tried that makeup that we bought and three minutes later, somehow her skin was covered with rushes and I was just shocked. So at this moment, there was one question that came up to my mind and that was, why? Why did my sister get rushes all over her face from natural products. I thought the natural meant 100% safe and made out of 100% natural ingredients. But the truth is, it wasn't. I started to look up the definition of it, but it didn't even exist. You can say natural for products that might be only using 1% of natural ingredients, which makes Many people think it's safe and they see natural uh, when they see the natural on the label. You know, it's, it's kind of the same when, when you think about what is sustainable, what is like eco-friendly. So natural actually meant natural like this. It doesn't have any definition because I found out something I, I had never even thought of. I started to wonder if there are more deceitful claims in cosmetics industry, how are they testing the products? Whether it's the use to makeup containers was after putting into the bin. As I question myself and research more, there are two things I learned about. One is annual testing. Companies test new cosmetics products and ingredients to ensure humans can use them safely. But it wasn't that simple. Animals are suffering, even dying for someone's beauty. Worldwide, half a million rabbits and other animals are blinded, poisoned, and killed every year, according to the Lush, uh, Lush Cosmetics North America. The second thing I learned about 
<clears throat> was that there are environmental issues caused through disposing makeup containers. Most makeup containers are, as you know, made out of single use plastic because it's cheap and very strong, but does it get recycled? I thought everything would get recycled, but it, it, it wasn't like that. The answer was no. Even if it's recyclable, even if we sort them accordingly, that doesn't mean it gets recycled. Well, I should say that um, in Japan, we only have a 20% recycling rate. And in the world, it's only 10%. And these numbers are just shocking. Because when you think about it, it's 80% or 90% of the plastic end up in a place like ocean or incinerator or like this. <clears throat> I've been to the one of the biggest trash dump in Bali, where it's about nine meters high and home to many wild animals. Surprisingly, all of the trash is not from Bali or even from the ocean. It's sent from some other countries. Even my country, Japan, sends trash to Indonesia as well. We put out too much garbage that we that can't be even handled within our country. So it will be sold and shipped to other countries like China, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc. Honestly, I was not interested in environmental issues just a couple of years ago because I couldn't really see the connection through <clears throat> our daily life. But when I visited this, tr this trash dump, I went, uh, was just so different some, <clears throat> from something I, I've seen in a textbook in Japan. So at this moment, knowing, that, knowing about facts like misleading natural claims, animal testing and environmental issues and my sister's rushes, I thought, why don't I just create my own wake up so that my sister can actually use without harm anything. It took me about two years of, of experimenting with recipes, and I and finally I made this lipstick. Non-toxic, sustainable lipstick made out of bamboo container. Um, in a process of creating lipstick, I realized that how important uh, the importance of knowing how each product we consume is made and the conscious choices we make through it. Because conscious buying habit can be the way for anyone to be a solution and not the problem of any issues in the, in the world. My green school teacher once said, you can be the solution. Also, <clears throat> Uh, you can be the problem and also the solution. So that means you can choose how you want to be. A lot of people think the government or big companies have to change to be a solution. But it's actually the change doesn't happen with only that. As climate, act, uh, as, as climate acti activist uh, Greta once said, we need a system change and the individual change to make a big difference in the world, especially things like the climate change or global warming. Because think about it, who chooses who will be the politicians? Who makes the company's profit? It's all us, the individual. Consumers' choices change Earth. And I, I wanted to tell this message to, uh, I wanted to tell this message in, in my country, Japan. So after coming back from Bali to Japan, I, um, I enrolled University of Keio in Japan for 
and studied about climate change and politics uh, for about one year. Yet I was no longer content to sit in a classroom when so much action is needed at a very pivotal moment for the planet. I had attended the COP24 and COP25 UN climate conferences and met many other inspiring young climate activists and knew how inspirational it would be simply for me to get in front of the other young Japanese people and share my story and passion and hope that more people feel motivated to take action on climate change. For this reason, I am currently taking a break from university to spread an awareness of climate change to youth, especially students who doesn't really have a chance to know what's going on right now, right here in our home. So in the past just 18 months, I visited more than 117 schools and gave presentations to more than 24,000 students <clears throat> from Hokkaido to Okinawa. And I, I've seen uncountable number of students start to take actions after my presentation. <clears throat> I do what I do because I believe our generation is the last hope to stop climate change. We can change our daily action and leave a positive or negative impact for the next generation depend, how we, depend on how we act. Thank you for listening. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. That was a very nice start start to the presentations of the conference um you have nice uh, or not, not not so nice um reasons why why you want to um, have a look at these issues so it's uh, it's it's always important to try to make a change if you notice that there is something something wrong wrong in the world thank you sheena yeah well i was i, I forgot to say that my voice is a little weird so it, it's not my actual <laughs> voice but sorry uh it's yeah. fine <laughs> yes, don't worry about that. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Sheena. Thank you too. Um, then the next uh, presenter is uh, Anestis Papadopoulos. He's um, the director of Platon Schools and the NO coordinator in, in Greece. And he will be talking about uh, co-creation challenge-based approaches uh, in addressing climate change. Uh, go ahead, Anestis. Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope you see my screen. Is that OK, Kaha? Yes, it looks good. OK. I'm glad that I attend and be here in this conference, in this initiative. I'm glad also that I, I see a lot of young people there. Uh, going back to my studies, I first heard about the climate change 40 years ago from a professor in the university. He was a professor. Zerefos, which is also very active in uh, climate change. And it was very strange these years, 40 years ago, as I mentioned, to discuss about this. It was something, uh, a crazy issue. But nowadays I see that it's, uh, it's uh, uh, many and many, especially young, young people, uh, motivated, uh, sensitized, aware about this uh, crucial issue. So what I will speak about is about is uh, on a pilot implementation that uh, we now apply in our school, uh, in Plato schools, uh, with the assistance of uh, my uh, two teachers. So um, uh, I will go on so okay so uh, why uh, about climate change and why um, co-creation and challenge based approach um, climate change is uh, i don't have to mention a lot uh, just uh, 
make a reference on uh, uh, of the future of Europe uh, uh, conference that uh, one month ago was held by the European Parliament, European Commission, which says that nine out of 10 of, uh, young people, um, they agree that uh, tackling climate change will uh, advance their well-being at, at school. Uh, why co-creation? Co-creation is uh, it's a, an approach that uh, gives um, the opportunity to students to be more active in their learning process. Um, they, in this uh, approach, students can co-design and co-create their and their peers' didactics uh, pathways. Also, they have the opportunity to be more um, uh, self-esteem and have the sense of their own ownership of their learning process. And why challenge-based? Because through challenge-based approach, they focus on a specific aspect of climate change, and also it's a solution-driven approach. Uh, so we decided to apply it in, uh, uh, in students, pupils of 11 years old. This is the last grade of primary school education system in Greece. There are 26 students and two teachers. And uh, we're in the process of finalizing this uh, uh, this. Uh, this testing phase. Um, let's see the how. Uh, we organized six sessions. I think now we are on the fourth session. Two hours each, every hour is 45 minutes to mention that. During the first session, uh, we all already done it. Uh, we asked students to fill in a questionnaire pretest regarding knowledge and attitudes to climate change and co-creation approach. There was an introduction on climate change dimensions. This was done by the teacher. There was a description of the work, what, who, when, and how, and the team's formulation. In, in the second session, because the hours are consecutive, uh, there was a challenge selection by the teams and the talent design and development by the students. We'll uh, give uh, more details in, uh, later on. In, in the fifth and sixth um, hour, the three, third session, uh, it's, uh, it's done the challenge design and development by the students, articulation resources among the writers. On the fourth, where I think we are now, the challenge circulation among the teams and starting the teamwork, the teacher in this um, uh, uh, application work as facilitator. In the fifth, they continue with the teamwork. And in the last session, we have the group presentations around the discussion and the answering of uh, the question at the post test. And we want to see, we'll see if we have uh, activation and learning gains from this. So I will go in a little bit more detail in every step. The introduction of what is climate change by the teacher was done by some resources. And we mentioned some of them. The team formulation is, uh, was done by four or five students. Uh, we suggest as optional roles which are given to, to our students. One is designer, one or two researcher, one uh, writer and one presenter. This has to be done, uh, it's optional because uh, it can be uh, not a distinguishation of, uh, of uh, roles. But we decided to do so according to the uh, students' abilities. Um, and uh, on the third step, there was a selection by each team. Uh, 
And during the first step, sorry, I go back, okay? Start the design and development by the students. The students have to, uh, each team, had to prepare uh, to fill in this template in order to give it to another team. They have to, write, to choose a title. They have to prepare the big picture uh, to prepare a diagram uh, like this one. Uh, some dimensions, will, it's an example, three dimensions, they, they, they could choose more. Uh, the units of every dimension. And then uh, they have to prepare as an articulation, a video or a sketch on an art or movie to um, orient uh, their peers and uh, prepare resources, relevant resources for, uh, for the topic that they have chosen and the suggestion on the mode. Also, they had to write their names. The fifth step, every team uh, give to the next team their challenge. So uh, there is a circulation among teams. And as for example, the team B take the challenge from which is prepared by the team A. And it's going on this way. So after start the work presentation, the, the, the work of the students, and then the final step, the students have to present uh, in 15 minutes the work that they have done in the mode that they have chosen. It, was, it can be a collage, a video, a game, a presentation, a sketch, whatever they want. Uh, in their work, they have to uh, right among others activities for their near environment, family, relatives, friends, uh, suggestions on engagement of local community and some global activity like participation competitions in conferences like these campaigns and also other bibliography resources and team members. Just to go back a little bit to understand uh, the circulation among teams, I mentioned it, but I have to say it one more. Once more, every team prepare the challenge for, the, for another team. And the, the team A prepare the, the challenge for team B and team B had, has to work on the challenge that it was given from the team A. Team C, the challenge from team B and go this way. So this was the, uh, the overall scheme. And I hope that in around 10 days from now that we will finish uh, the implementation, we'll have good results regarding mainly motivation and of course, why not some learning gains. Uh, so thanks for hearing me and I'm here to answer later on any questions or queries may arise. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Anestis. Uh, this was a very good um, good example of how we have to work together and co-creation and uh, collaborative learning and these kind of things are very important so that we don't just stick to what we have in our own heads or how we process information in our own heads, but we also share that with uh, with other students, with other staff members, with other people all around the world, and then uh, create new knowledge based on, on what the individual uh, people, people know. So thank you very much, uh, Anestis, for this uh, presentation. Then uh, we're a little bit ahead of the schedule, which is quite um, new. But um, while, uh, before we start with the student presentations, I will just uh, show quickly, uh, so those who are on YouTube also, uh, you have the link. Um, you have the link here uh, on the on the live stream where you can participate in the um, in the mm, in the Padlet to, to discuss discuss. So uh, I will share my screen so you can see it if you haven't seen it there yet. 
So at the bottom, uh, bottom here uh, in the live stream, there's the there's the link uh, going to the to the Padlet where you can then participate in the discussion and also ask questions from the different uh, different speakers as well. Okay, then um, we will go on with the next uh, presentation, the first student uh, presentations. Um, they are Kilian, Maite and Irene from Villa Pircas in uh, Canary Islands in Spain. Uh, and they will be talking about uh, energy issues. So go ahead. And you can unmute your microphone. Hi, everybody. We are Maite, Kilian, and Irene, and we are going to present you our job, our job, sorry, our project, uh, Every Last Drop of Energy. The human body has the need to move, express, sing, and that generates energy. We have been able to discover those little details, hoping that a possible solution is in that last drop of energy. The main problem in our region uh, is invasive species. In Canary Islands, we have more than 200 uh, endemisms that arise from the variety of microclimates that exist in the archipelago. These species are endangering many others unique in the world. In addition, regarding our proposed topic on the use of energy, it should be noted that one of our islands, El Hierro, is supplied 100% with green energy. Next slide, please. Okay, our first proposal is called the power of exercise, which tries to take advantage of the movement of the movement, sorry, of exercise machines in the streets and gyms to generate um, energy and use it both for public lighting or for the own gym. Um, there are two type, uh, two types of motor machines: manuals and electrics. With a manual machine, you are the motor that makes it smooth. But with a, while with an electric machine, uh, it comes with a built electric motor. Like, we, like you can see in the presentation, in Spain, we have 8.8 .8 million uh, points of light with a power of 156 watts for every point and approximately 4,000 hours of use per year, which represents an electricity consumption of um, 5,000 approximately watts per year. And taking account that each municipality has approximately one gym, that one gym has more or less 15, 11, 15 machines which are able to produce uh, 116 watts per hour with a single training lesson, we can do a relation and calculate that approximately we're going to generate um, 90 million watts per day in all the country. And it could be like, it could, it could see like, oh my God, this is a big number, but the real is that no. Um, it is enough to it is enough to maintain all the public lighting for, for example, a country like Spain. But it could be used for maintaining the public lighting of the city that consumes more energy in Spain, which is Barcelona. Next picture, please. Okay, um, our next proposal is called "A Small Step for Men, but a Big Step to Breathe." In our day today, we need to move uh, from one place to another, and a simple step can be another alternative for green energy. To take advantage of that energy, our idea is to install pavements in all the streets with power generators. Each step generates seven watts approximately. In London, this idea is already in process since they were invented by the Pavilion Company, uh, and they are made with recyclable materials and 5% of the energy produced is consumed by the um, tile and the remaining 95% uh, can be used on site or restored for a later use. In addition, it can be placed in specific areas such as airports, uh, streets with high traffic of people, uh, roads, uh, etc. In addition, it, um, one example is the busiest airport in the world, that is in Atlanta, Georgia, United States, with approximately um, 54 million daily passengers, which translate into uh, around 3 million watts in 24 hours, uh, which means that if an average house in Spain consumes uh, around 3 kilowatts a year, it will supply um, 1,000 homes for approximately one year. Another example is in Gran Street, 
which has the record of highest traffic of people in Spain, approximately uh, 35,000 translate into uh, 200 words in 24 hours. Next picture, please. Noise is not that bad at all. We all have those neighbors who complain about noise at any time of the day. It seems that they're upset even in silence. What they don't know is that noise is not that bad at all. Uh, that's those decibels that may annoy our delicate ear, ear that are created when we listen to a fake song, when we go to a Dua Lipa concert, or when we take a plane to our summer holidays. Uh, can be channeling a wonderful energy. There's those sound of excitement when we see, when we see our idol. Uh, will be used to light a lead bomb all the night. United States in 2020, uh, more than 4 million gigawatts were consumed. Consider that going to a disco to dance and sing uh, produce 0.1 gigawatts. And given the, that there are 195 countries uh, in which there are parties and concerts at any time of the day, uh, with a week of partying, we could provide an entire year of energy to United States and more countries. Now, noise is not that bad. After this amount of data, let's get to work. Let the singer that we all have inside come out, that those decibels go up and that this last drop of energy doesn't end. Um, so in conclusion, we could say that uh, we could manage to complete the supply facilities with this type of energy that does not run out. So thank you for listening to us. That was our presentation and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, thank you, Kili and Maite and Irene. Um, this is uh, very, very nice to see that uh, with our daily activities like walking or driving the car, you can also create energy if you want and you have the technology to do that. So that's a good, good example of, um, of how, to, how to address climate change and how to use energy or how to produce energy uh, in, in a good way. Um, yes, so uh, thank, you. thank you to Kili and Maite and Irene. Um, like I said, that we are a little bit ahead of schedule, but uh, that is okay. Uh, we can we can live with that. Uh, we have given quite strict timelines for our presenters on, on how much time they can use for their presentations, so they are uh, keeping keeping the time very well. Uh, we will continue now with the next presentation. Uh, it is uh, Iroha Kuwata, and she is from the Ueda Senior High School in Japan, and uh, she will be. Uh, talking uh, talking about uh, school her school and uh, the possibilities of insulating there so please go ahead hello everyone my name is kwata iroha I'm a first year student at Ueda Senior High School. I'm going to talk about one of my projects to contribute to solving climate change. Next, next slide, please. Climate change is continuing and having an effect all over the world. As a result, abnormal weather like heat waves, big typhoons, and heavy rainfall have been happening more frequently in recent years. Look at the picture on the left. A huge typhoon struck in 2019, causing great damage in various parts of Japan. The bridge was destroyed due to heavy rain caused by the typhoon. It is in the city where I live. I was scared and realized that global warming is really happening and impacting our lives. Look at picture on the right. This is my classroom. This classroom is hot in summer and cold in the winter, even with heating and cooling. Why is that? Because it is not insulated. Insulation is created by introducing material that prevents the loss of air. There are many gaps in uninsulated buildings. The room doesn't get warm in the, in the winter or cool in the summer because air escapes through the gaps. Air flows in and out, not only through the gaps, but also the windows. If the window is thin, 
heat were passed through it, closing gaps in buildings and improving window performance are important in insulation. Also, if you insulate, you can reduce energy consumption by preventing air from escaping. Most of the schools in Japan are not inflated because they are so old. Therefore, we waste energy and we can't concentrate in our classes because of the room temperature. Next slide, please. In 2021, December 19th, we had an installation which was a workshop in Uda High School. Its purpose was to reduce energy consumption and improve environment for studying. It was held in Uda High School and we installed the classroom. About 20 students joined and about 40 people assisted in the project. Some specialists came to Uda High School and taught us how to installate together is in the classroom. We worked in two parts, attaching insulating materials to the wall and making double glazed windows. The pictures above show the insulating material attached to the wall. First, wooden frames were put on the wall by specialists. We cut insulating materials to fit the size of the frame and put them in it. After that, boards were attached from above so that the heat insulating materials could not be seen. The pictures below show double glazed windows. We made double glazed windows with polycarbonates. First, we built window frames with wood. We put two pieces of polycarbonates in the frame and fixed it with a screw. We finally we insulated the windows. Please, next slide. The look of the wall changed to warm one. Please, next slide. Today, I'm going to present some results of this workshop in terms of the actual temperature on the, of the room and students' perception. The left graph shows the room temperature change in the room in the two classrooms. This graph was made by Mr. Ito, who is a high school teacher. Blue line is the temperature by the window at, at the not insulated room. Red line is temperature by the window at the insulated room. Green points are outside temperature. The non insulated classroom has more hot days than the insulated one because the non insulated classroom is used more often than the insulated one and heating is used longer than the insulated one. Looking at the code today, the temperature of an insulated classroom has dropped to about 5 degrees Celsius, but that of insulated one is about 10 degrees Celsius. Also, in an insulated one, the room temperature does not easily drop below 10 degrees Celsius. That is, the room temperature is kept constant by insulation. Red graph shows the results of the questionnaire. A total number of 60 students answered the questionnaire. 67.3% of students answered the classroom after insulation was warmer than the classroom before installation. I would like to continue my research to find out how to use the classroom installation project to reduce energy consumption. I learned how difficult it is to organize a project and it needs the cooperation of many people. Following up on this experience, I have more to do. Next slide, please. First, I will make instructions on how to insulate the schools. I would like to expand the insulation workshops. If there are instructions, I think it will be easier to do workshops at any school. Second, I want to insulate more classrooms. Insulating one classroom has little effect on reducing energy consumption. 
I want to further research, uh, further isolate, and reduce energy consumption. Also, I want to increase the number of volunteers who can work with us to complete the project. I hope that many people are interested in global warming and take action even if they are small. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Iroha, for your presentation. Again, a good example, a co concrete example of what can be done in schools, for example, to reduce, um, to reduce uh, the use of energy and also to increase um, the, the human, human um, well-being uh, as, as it is not too, not too cold also in, in the winter time. Thank you, Iroha. Then the last present student presentation for today will be made by students from the Hakuba SDG, SDG labs, um, Keisuke, Hinano and Nao. So um, welcome and uh, you can start your presentation. Hello. Uh, we are SDGs Labo. I am now I'm a first year student of Asia Pacific University and I'm studying about environment problems such as climate change. Hi, I'm Hitano. I'm a freshman of Nagoya University of Foreign Studies. I major in English education. And actually there's one more. He is a case guest. Unfortunately, today he is absent. But today we will talk about our project and what we valued. Next slide, please. Um, these are what we worked on. We focused on climate change and began to work. First, as pictured above show, we held the global climate strike. Then we became interested in the climate change a climate refugees, so we held a climate treaty border. As our final, as our high school final project, we ensured our class to use energy efficiency. Next slide, please. Uh, during our project, people ask what made us active. The first factor is because we love snow. When we were high school students, we lived in Hakuba. As all of you know, Hakuba is famous for high quality snow. In our case, the ski resort was really close to us. So we went skiing and snowboarding almost every day. Also for Hakuba's industry, sightseeing during winter is the main business. So people are sensitive about climate change. If we have a lack of snow, it breaks the seasonal cycle and it will lead it would be difficult to attract people. For Keisuke, he is actually the one who has been attracted by the snow. And he decided to come to Hakuba High School for his favorite ski type, the free light skiing. And he is working as a ski patroller now. Next slide, please. However, in 2020, when we were second grade high school students, we realized that we had less snow than usual. Hakuba suffered from a lack of snow. In this year, some ski resort could open only a few skiing courses. Please go to next. The second factor is we think it is important to join, uh, enjoy ourselves and make it fun. Many people think taking action for climate change sounds difficult and hard. We wanted to get rid of the negative images. So we always made interesting and fun events, as you can see in these pictures. Additionally, when we held the first event, we only had a few participants of our generation. Therefore, whenever we planned events, we focused on the target audience and considered on the concept depending on the target. For these reasons, we were able to continue to take actions successfully 
and people of all generations join us in our actions. Please go to next. Thank you. Final factor is because we are able to generate interest from the local community. In Hakuba village, there are many people who deeply care about the environment and are interested in climate change. So when we had our first action, many people joined us. Some people participated in our action because they were, they were aware of the problem, but they didn't know what they can do themselves for climate change. And others came because they had already taken actions and they wanted to connect with many people through our projects. We were inspired by all those people. Furthermore, by building our network, we were able to continue and support each other actions. These three factors motivated us. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, this is a conclusion of our presentation. What we learned and what we can tell you from our action is that to know the area where you will take action is really important. Like, you know, regional characteristic and people who live in the area. In our case, the feature is snow and people loved it. By knowing them, it can be easier to make actions which make people feel familiar with the issue. Also, we found that considering the issue like a personal problem might sound difficult for many. Most people think taking an action against climate change is complicated. At first, I thought it isn't my business, but the Japanese government should do something if it's, it's a, such a big problem. Um, however, when we, I mean, all of us here change how we see climate change, like regarding it as a personal problem, better action would be taken and it would lead to a better world. When we took actions, we realized our passion can be the energy of changing people. Um, if we keep having our passion, more people who have the same thought would join. Finally, it can change people as well as the world. There are the keys, we think. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Hinano and now and uh, give my regards to Keisuke also. It's a, a pity he couldn't join us, but um, you did a good job on his behalf as well. So thank you. Yes, again, another good, good example of, of, <clears throat> of how um, something that is personal to you, some personal um, impacts of, of climate change, for example, if you have uh, less snow than you used to have and you like to ski or go uh, skating or doing some ski, uh, snow sports, um, that can uh, kind of like spark, uh, spark your enthusiasm to do something about, uh, about climate change. And whatever the issue is, um, it, it is quite, quite common that once you start uh, doing something actively on, on that, uh, that front, uh, it, it will spread also around you and also uh, to a wider, wider network of people as well. But thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Then the last presentation for today uh, is uh, Tremor uh, Denigo from, uh, and he's a European education expert. And uh, he will actually also be leading the discussion after his presentation. And um, welcome, Tremo, and uh, you can start your presentation. Hello, everyone. Very glad to be here. Very impressed by the, uh, the quality of the presentation on the projects of the, the students. So I'm here today to talk to you about what the uh, European Union is doing, because I'm Tremo de Nigo and I'm working at the European Commission. So the European Commission, for those among you who don't know, is the uh, executive branch, if you want, of the European Union. And it has the uh, legislative initiatives, so it does a lot of things. Uh, and uh, I'm going to explain to you what we're trying to do for what regards education for environmental sustainability. So we'll share my screen. I get a presentation. And uh, I will explain that. Hoping it works. So you let me know if it doesn't work. That's it. 
So this is it. The title is Education for Climate, which is precisely the name of a tool that we developed, but I'm going to say a couple of words about that. So um, all what I'm going to explain today is part of uh, what we call the Green Transition Actions. It's part of uh, the Green Deal. You see here in green, complements Green Deal Actions. So basically, what is the Green Deal? Uh, in the European Union, uh, we are trying to set up a few policies. Uh, and these policies have got a big target that you know, uh, of course, which is the one you can see on the left of that screen. We are trying to become climate neutral by 2050. And we have uh, other targets. We've got mid targets for 2030, for instance. We uh, will reduce the, um, the carbon emissions by um, 50 to 55%. So obviously it's a, it's a lot of things that are going to be done to uh, reach such a target um, regarding uh, energy, regarding industry uh, consumption, but also education, which is what I'm going to explain today. The Green Deal also, you see the second point, aims to protect human life, animals, plants, the biodiversity crisis is, uh, is an issue, a big one. And the Green Deal is, is trying to tackle this as well. Uh, it will help companies, of course, uh, to make the transition. And last but not least, you can see on, the, on the, the right part of the screen, it has to help ensure a just and inclusive transition. What does that mean? It means that no one and no place has got to be left behind in that transition. But what about education? That's a big question, really. Um, the first thing I want to tell you, so as to be very clear, is that in the Re European Union, education is a national responsibility, which means that every member state, so France, Italy, Germany, they deal with their education system. And there's no one that can tell them to do this or that. They are responsible for the education system. But at the European Union level, uh, we can still invite the member states to try to align for certain objectives and we give what we call uh, a support to ensure that there is a, a quality education in all the member states. And we started from there. You see this uh, very uh, striking uh, data. You've got nine in ten Europeans that think that climate change is the most serious problem in the world. And I'm sure that all of you here today share that view. And you've got, uh, which is the, uh, the outcome of a very interesting survey that was done uh, for uh, a council recommendation I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, that shows that you've got six in, six in 10 young people, six in 10, 60%, that globally are very or extremely worried about climate change. And, Three in four, 75% of the respondents to uh, that survey have said that education and training is the most important sector to help people understand and take action on climate change. And this is really what is the most important thing there. And what I want to focus on today, how do we help people understand and take action action on climate change in education. Because many young people, and this is perhaps your case, consider that education and training is failing to prepare them to tackle climate change. So obviously, there are some extraordinary schools out there. Sheena was talking about green schools, amazing school. And Estes was explaining what he's doing with his students in his school, which is also very impressive. And you students, you shared with us your projects that are absolutely superb. But is it the case everywhere? Is it the case for all the schools? Are all the students and teachers involved in projects that focus on environmental uh, sustainability? Let me tell you, no, it's not the case. So today I'm going to talk to you about three things, three main actions that the European Union is doing to help things change. 
The first thing that might be uh, appear a bit boring, but it's super important. It's a policy tool. So it means it's something that will help countries to ensure that change, that transformation. It's what we call a proposal for a council recommendation. So it sounds very technical what it is. In the European Union, you've got different institutions. So I'm working for one, which is called European Commission. But the people who decide, who take really actions are the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union. And here, it's a council recommendation. So it means a recommendation which is uh, uh, done by all the member states or the countries of the European Union on all together, they will say, okay, we agree on a common objective about learning for environmental sustainability. So that's something important because it means that all these countries will share a common view on what they have to do to strengthen the capacities of the member states for what regards learning for environmental sustainability so as to change the way we teach and learn. So the objectives of that recommendation, which is currently being studied by the Council, the Council so it's, it's happening now, and it should be adopted normally in the coming month, is to do this, you see? It's certainly on the top right to provide ideas and inspiration so as to uh, strengthen cooperation between the member states and to encourage investment, but it's also to support policy making uh, so as to be sure that all the countries adopt measures that will give the possibility to strengthen the capacities, okay? There are different key concepts in the proposal, so I can't go too much into the details. Anyway, I will put the link so that if you're interested, you can learn uh, more about it but by reading it. But basically, it's you've got three main uh, areas. The first one is on education. On the Green Deal, so we... Uh, um, respond to the challenges of the green transitions in education. The second one is building on progress because there are things that, are, of course, uh, exist out there. So we want to build on, 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 on progress, on, on move to fully embed environmental sustainability in the education system. And we want also to connect, connect learning uh, in or, uh, with other education agendas. But I mean, the, the most important thing is that one maybe. But that text is, is, is interesting because it's, it's divided, if you want, in different targets. So it's a recommendation which is for the, the world systems, you know, education system. So how in France they will try to fully embed environmental sustainability in their education system. So there are recommendations for the world system. There are also recommendations for the learners, so students, pupils, how to provide them with opportunities for high quality learning uh, regarding that topic, but also recommendation for educators on institutions. Um, so that was the first big tool, which is being developed at the moment by the European Union to help member states change education system. The second one is that one, and I'm sure you will be very interested by that one. It's what we call a European sustainability competence framework. So what is a framework? Well, basically, it's something that will help us define what are the green skills. So we've been talking today, and I've been listening to you about how do we develop the knowledge of the students and pupils, and how do we give them uh, competences uh, that are uh, related to environmental sustainability. So these are the, the so-called green skills, if you want. The thing is that we, we all agree on an international level to uh, develop these skills, but there was not really a common understanding and definition on what it is. So here comes that green comp, which is a competence framework that define uh, what are the green skills, what are the uh, green competencies. Um, so it's, it's divided, you see the, the circle on the left, it's, it's divided in four main competence areas. One is on acting, so doing concrete things on sustainability. The other one is on values, on how do we uh, embody sustainability values. Another one, which is very interesting to my view, is how do you envision, uh, envision sustainable futures? And the first one, which is maybe the most important one to my view, embracing complexity in sustainability. So these are the main competence areas. And within 
these competence areas, you've got 12 competences with a very detailed set of parameters and definitions because you've got uh, 180 statements that define knowledge, skills, and attitudes for each competence. So that helps, of course, uh, schools, uh, teachers, students, but business also to better define uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes for these green competencies. So here is the, uh, the, 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 the same version of the president one, but with more detail. So you can see again the four main areas. You see the, 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 the colorful boxes on the top. So embodying sustainability values, but then you've got the different competencies. And if you, let's check, for instance, the second one, embracing complexity in sustainability. So there's one competence on systems thinking, one on critical thinking, and one on problem framing. And then if you go even more into the detail, you've got an explanation for every of these competences. So you, here again, you see the second part, for instance, in yellow, embracing complexity and sustainability. So that's something that define an area of the competence that should be developed uh, for what regards to so green skills. Then you've got systems thinking, critical thinking, and product framing, and then a definition. So if you take, for instance, one which is very important, systems thinking, what it is, so you have to approach a sustainability challenge from all sides with a very holistic view to consider time, space, context in order to understand how elements within and between systems interact. That, that definition of interaction, of, of interlinking uh, competences is something which is very important. So now we've got that green comp, which is a competence framework. And the last thing that will certainly interest you even more is a proper tool, very much linked to what Anestis was explaining before. It's a tool that will give you the possibility to do, to act. It's what we call a community of practice, and it's called Education for Climate Coalition. So what it is, what is a community of practice? So we aim to have with that tool a participatory education community. So who uh, is a member of, of taking part uh, into that community? You, I mean, teachers, educators, the broad sense of the term, so you can be teachers from primary school or from, uh, uh, from university, uh, higher education or vocational training, that doesn't matter. Students and pupils, same thing. And the community at large around, we call education stakeholders, coming from NGOs, coming from associations, people like me, you know, who used to be teachers who become uh, policy officers that are interested in education for environmental sustainability. Um, together, uh, we can try to develop some, co-develop together solutions. So this community of practice is, that's what I, I would like to, to keep in mind today, is it, 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 it can be your lab. It's a, we call it experimentarium. So it's a, to give you the possibility to act together and co-develop solutions together, right? But on which priorities, these are the five main innovation areas we want to focus on. So it's certainly, because it's still very important, uh, about raising awareness, because as you know, I mean, the uh, awareness is not at the same level, uh, considering the, the people, the schools, the regions, the, uh, the, the, the countries. It's also about, of course, training teachers, as you can see on the bottom right. It's also, uh, so it's a very important one because uh, UNESCO, for instance, has, has clearly shown that the majority of teachers are willing to teach more on sustainability, on environment, but they don't feel uh, that they have the right skills and knowledge to do it. It's also about changing behaviors, which is a very important one when it comes to education, because uh, we need to have citizens, we need to have uh, um, professionals who know how to behave uh, uh, in, um, um, in, a, in a very sustainable way. It's also about, you see on the uh, bottom left, of course, developing great skills and competences, which is kind of obvious and linked to the uh, competence framework I was talking about before. And it's also, which is an important one for us at the European Commission uh, where I'm working because we are uh, 
uh, the Joint Research Center where I'm working is uh, composed of scientists of te and technicians who develop some applied science to, to back up and support uh, the European policies. It's about bridging education with science. Um, this is something that we call the Community Manifesto. It has been developed with people like Anestis, who is a member of our community. It's something which is always, all what we do is co-develop with the very members of that community. So we organize a lot of meetings and workshops and focus groups, etc. And we came up with that manifesto, which is a common declaration statement. And we all agree on what we have to do together. And this is what we want to achieve. You see on the bottom of that, uh, of that uh, kind of leaf of different color, colors, you got inspire, develop, and draw on European education capabilities to support the changes needed for a climate neutral society. So it sounds a bit uh, official, but that's the uh, common goal we're trying to have. But how do we do that concretely? First, we want to be uh, always very collaborative and, and, and insist on, as you see on the left, on a participatory approach in all what we do. It's something we, we do together. And on the right, uh, one of the main goal is to tackle fragmentation. What does that mean? Well, we would like to try to break down walls. And walls are uh, sometimes physical so, or sometimes virtual. You can have wall between people, between schools, between classes, between domains. Uh, for instance, I used to be a teacher uh, for many years in different countries, and I was uh, always very... Uh, I, I should say disappointed not to have more of a possibility to work with my colleagues and to see that my, the, the math teachers and the, and the history teachers were never working together because we were in a system where it was just not possible. So how do we tackle that sort of fragmentation? This is, and I will finish on that, which is the online collaborative platform where, and that's my main message for today, I invite you to join and to register. I will share with you the links afterwards, of course. What you see there is the homepage of that online, big online collaborative platform where you can meet people, share with them ideas, thoughts, uh, projects. Uh, for instance, the project we, you share with us today, but which is more, uh, more important, it uh, also gives you the possibility. You see uh, uh, the, the, the yellow part right in the center of the screen, the challenge experimentarium. So what does that mean concretely? It means that once you will have in us all collaborative platform, uh, meet people, share ideas with them on information, you will be able to enter in, um, in a, a conversation with them. But more than that, we will be able, you will be able, as Anestis was explaining before, to co-create together a specific solution. So what can it be? This is up, you to, to, up to you to decide. It can be on, I don't know, developing an online course, uh, working on a curriculum, or uh, developing, for instance, a specific initiative regarding a water treatment that could apply to schools. Again, this is not for us to decide. This is for the very community members to come up with uh, common solutions together and co-create these things all together in what we call the challenge experimentarium. So I will stop here. I will stop here because my main message now is that I hope you will join and you will be able to co-develop solutions with uh, your peers in that uh, community platform uh, so as to change things and to strengthen education for environmental sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Tremois. Um, this is a very good, uh, good um, thing to keep in mind that uh, we, we have to work together, uh, the academics, uh, education system, students, uh, other, uh, other stakeholders, um, governments, and so on. And also that uh, climate change is never uh, to be considered as, as uh, um, referring to only one group of people or one group of professionals or so on. It's a very wide, wide issue. And, and the fact that um, I already mentioned in anesthesia or after anesthesia uh, presentation is that when we think of things together on how to how to deal with things together and build knowledge on that instead of having our individual knowledge um, then we can uh, achieve much more 
Yes, thank you, uh, Tremua. Uh, Tremua will be leading the discussion and uh, he will be, um, I hope you can find in the chat uh, questions. Kat, uh, Katya has uh, picked up some questions from the Padlet and uh, the participants can still uh, post questions and comments in the Padlet as well. But uh, I will give the floor back to you, Tremua. Thank you. So, so that's my pleasure to, to, to lead the discussion. So how should I proceed? So I see uh, questions on the chat and I'm trying to play also with the Padlet, but maybe someone is willing to react uh, and take the floor to uh, say something on the presentation but, but have been done. So I, I guess that I can check who has raised his yes. or her uh, hand. Yes, you can just check from the chat box. Uh, Katya has posted the questions there that you can ask from the presenters. Okay. And uh, if the presenters, if you don't have your cameras on at the moment, uh, please switch them on so we can um, spotlight you. Thank you. So there is a, uh, from what I see, Katya was asking something to Anistis. I think it's an interesting one, which is about on the impact assessment in a way. So Anestis was explaining uh, the initiative that was uh, developed in, in his schools and, and Katia was asking, how did the students take up the, the task and react to it? And uh, I mean, did you assess also the, the, really the, uh, the impact of that initiative on the, on the students? Anestis, maybe you can uh, enlighten us on that, on that aspect. Yeah. Um, as mentioned before, <clears throat> uh, this, um, uh, this implementation, this pilot, is uh, on the process now. We're in the fourth uh, session, and uh, in uh, around ten days from now, maybe two weeks, we'll have also the post test, which is the same pre and post test. So probably there, in two weeks from now, we'll have more concrete results. We had around ten questions to answer uh, concerning uh, mainly attitudes and knowledge, and uh, regarding their uh, interest motivation. As far as I know, up to now, they they seem motivated, especially now they're preparing the challenges for the other teams, because uh, we're in this phase now. Uh, I hope that uh, we will have good results, but we will see that. Uh, this is the first, um, uh, let's say, the first uh, information I have from what the teachers. Um, um, see uh, while they're implementing uh, uh, this, uh, this initiative. Let's say motivational is going well, but let's see learning gains also. Thank you, Anistis. So I, I, bear with me. I'm sorry if I don't go into uh, any kind of order. I'm just picking up a question that I, I can see. There was an interesting question that was asked to uh, Shina Tsuyuki. Uh, on, on the on the Padlet, from what I see, uh, asking if uh, she was thinking that education system in Japan on worldwide uh, should integrate sustainability concepts in curriculum from elementary schools from from a very uh, very early in the life of uh, of students. What do you think, Shina, on that? I don't know if Shina is still with, with us. Are you still there, Sheena? She's I'm muted not at the moment. Sure. Maybe we can come back to her. Okay, so we will come back to, to, to her uh, later on. Okay, so now I'm uh, trying to play with all my screens. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a bit complicated. Um, okay. Um, okay. So many comments on the tablet. So, oh, Sheena is here now. Ah, uh, Sheena is here. Yes. She, Sheena, you, you're with us. There was a, an interesting question for you asking if you think that it would be worth adding to the curriculum in Japan, but uh, you can go beyond Japan, of course. Uh, elements uh, related to uh, education uh, for environmental sustainability, but also from the very elementary schools, from very early. Uh, uh, during the childhood. What do you think, uh, Shina, on that? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. But uh, I, I just want to ask that, like, what kind of education, like, curriculum specifically on, like, a climate uh, education or, like, how we act on it or? Yes, I think so. I think so. 
Oh yeah. Okay. Yo, yes, yes. I, I would say a hundred percent. We should uh, definitely have to put an education, like a class that we, we can learn about what's going on. Not only that, but how we can act and the support should should support uh, uh, the school should should support uh, students to take action on it because I was able to do all the things when I was in high school because of the environment I had when I was in green school. But I know that Japanese school doesn't have much support. And it would be much harder for students to take action if there's no environment and no supports around. So yeah, it's not only about how teacher should change, but it's just the system itself. Which is much more difficult as a matter of fact. Thank yes, you, Shinya, yes, for that. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's true. why the smooth. I'm, I'm going to the school and, and visiting, uh, giving presentation because it's much easier than changing the system. And um, as an emergency issue, then I thought I, I should do whatever I can at this moment. Yeah, but in, in the future, like, I, I definitely want to change the system, whole system by itself, yes. Okay, you're invited hey. to join the community, Shina. <laughs> Thank you. I have another question, which is for now, uh, an interesting one. It's, a, it's important to think, uh, it's said there in the question, from the perspective of the locals and take their views into account. So what about the relation with the, the, the very people that are living around uh, the school? So what was the most difficult, challenging part? This is a question for now if now is willing to give an answer. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, there, there are not import, uh, difficult point, but we valued, we valued that, um, we we work work well with local people and we explain about what we want to do for cl climate change. So um, <laughs> yeah. so we think there were not difficult point because the local people deeply understand about climate change. Thank you. Hinano, maybe you want to add something? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't come up with any difficulty actually, because as now said, the locals are deeply understanding the environmental issue more than us. So they told us what is happening now. And yeah, so. I didn't come up any difficulty for now. That's good for you because it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hiroa, there was a, a question for you. So I'm not fully sure to understand, but it's the question is, is the following one. Have you heard of our students who use their knowledge at their houses at home? So I guess it refers to the knowledge that was developed during your, your project, maybe. So what about other students uh, that should, uh, should have used uh, what they learn at home uh, in the houses? Do you understand, Hiroa? I think you've got to turn on your mic, Hiroa. Thank you for a great question. You understood the question, Irwa? 
this and uh, this project is <laughs> run by specialist. So we just get so we we just came to workshop. We just came to workshop. We learned. And we learned. We learned how to insulate insulate how to do insulation together. We we learned how to insulate together. We didn't, we didn't bring any knowledge. So I think there's someone with you. Maybe we can see him. We didn't know any knowledge about. We didn't know any knowledge about this project. And, and I think the, the way I understood the question, maybe I'm wrong, is that did it make a change for the, the students, the very students involved in project? Did they change their behaviors afterwards and adapt what they've learned uh, in their daily uh, life at home? At least did, did that's the way I understand the question. Yeah, so, so did the students insulate their homes, for example, after the project? That's it. <laughs> あ、すいません。聞こえますか。え、と、長野県あの国際交流課のイアン、え、サックスでございます。え、もし難しかったら日本語でも大丈夫です。それから英語に通訳できますので。はい、はい、はい。I'm offering if there are any difficulties for um the Japanese speakers, um we can translate them into English as well, the Japanese yeah. comments. Sure. So we uh um, one more time, please. Sorry, I I speak Japanese. Yeah. So, I understand. Ah,質問はえ聞こえますか? え、聞こえます。はい。質問はあのこのプロジェクトからの知識はあの自宅でも使ったあの生徒たちはいるかどうかとかあのうんはい。えっと、このプロジェクトはえっと近くで使った人生徒はえっといなくてえっと自宅自宅で自宅あ自宅自宅家家ではいえっとはいいないですえっとこれはえっと学校のワークショップということでえっと専門家の人と一緒に Right. So the answer was uh, this was just a special school workshop. So they had some experts and specialists come in to help this time. So no students have used uh, similar projects at home yet, um, but there could be that possibility. So. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for the tra uh, translation. That's, that's very handy. Yes, as a matter of fact, because that's what we, we want to focus on, uh, uh, aren't we? We want to focus on the outcome, the, uh, I mean, the, the impact really of what all we, we are doing. So I, I had a question for, for you all because I'm not sure that I, I'm finding uh, questions on, on the Padlet. Um, do you, uh, I'm talking to the students, um, do you feel that um, your teachers, uh, are, I've got the possibility to work together on common project. Is this something which is easy for them to do? Or do you work with one teacher on a specific subject who is more interested in green education and this is it? Or do, are you in schools where you can see transversal projects or projects that involve a lot of your teachers, a lot of your schools? I, I would be very interested to learn more about your experience on that. Hinano, maybe you want to say something there, no? I see you nodding. No? <laughs> uh, well, uh, we have only one teacher who is really interested in the environmental issues, and he's really supported us. And uh, when we uh, when we think the idea of insuring our school. Actually, he was thinking 
how to stop us, but because the, our school was public school, but he finally he um, he asked the school president to initiate our uh, class with us, and he, yes, the, he was the only one teacher who is really supportive to us. Thank you, Inano. I was asking that because, you know, in, in what we, we've been doing uh, with the European Commission, we've been in contact with a lot of students like you and teachers. And a lot of teachers were telling us, you know, the problem we're facing is that we are obliged in a way to develop specific green projects in our uh, private time because we don't have the possibility really to do that within the curriculum or uh, it's very difficult to find a way to have common project within the timetable, the normal timetable. So they do that when they can, uh, based a bit on goodwill. And it's a bit of an issue because that way we won't maybe make a change. So I don't know, Kilian, my turn, Irene, what you think about that. How is it in your school? Hello, Hi. Hello. Okay. So okay. in our high school, for example, uh, teachers, I think that uh, all cooperate to do projects like uh, science projects, Erasmus, and also in subjects. And they are all together to study uh, what things we are, um, they are teaching, uh, something that they have to to do with us. And I, I don't know is if um, it's in Spain, um, but um, in our high school is uh, like that. Uh, you are muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was muted. <laughs> Maite Herede, you want to add something? Thank you, Kilian. No, it's it's true that what Kilian said. Um, all the teachers work together for try to do uh, projects like Kilian said, Erasmus or science projects or even um, sometimes we go to other classrooms of little kids and we press in our projects of science. So everyone knows what we're doing in the high school and it's like that. Even the students, we give uh, ideas to make projects, uh, for example, of environment or make, for example, a day that we can create plastic that we eat like food. Okay. Yeah, like that. that. That is super interesting. I mean, that idea of uh, having uh, students of your age presenting to younger students uh, what you're doing to be a bit ambassadors in a way is a, is a very, very interesting one. Uh, but we, e, e, sorry, please go ahead. We do that in all the projects of um, we ask for the other teachers, hey, can I uh, steal you five minutes of the class? So we, get, we want to speak the, we want to tell that to the little kids and we do. Also, we promote uh, like environmental projects in our high school. Like um, we are doing like a zero plastic breakfast in the break of the high school. And we can't uh, bring um, breakfast with plastic, only- um, Like for example, fruit. fruit. Um, and and I, I ju just got a, another question for you, on to, for everyone. Are these teachers um, teaching hard science or are they also uh, teaching social science? So basically, is it about more a biologist, uh, physicist, uh, or also uh, philosophers, historians, or whatever? I think that all the teachers, even the English teacher, the French teacher, that we create like the advertisement in different language and we put it around the high school. So all the teachers are involved, uh, involved in, the, um, in the situation. That's super interesting, really. Hmm. Thank you for that. Right. So, Kaisa, I'm just looking for other questions. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm seeing them. Or maybe I'm a bit lost in my screens. So yes, please uh, don't okay. hesitate if you, you spot one. Huh? Okay. Uh, you can at least have a look in the chat box in, in Zoom, but um, let's let's see what we have there. I think I tackled the question I've seen on the Zoom chat. Huh? Okay, all right. 
Uh, we have maybe time for one more question. So if there are any of uh, uh, any of the students or Anestis or Sheena, if you want to ask the other presenters any questions, I guess you haven't had time to go to go to the Padlet to ask questions. So if you have any questions for each other, you could ask those now. Because I've just seen many questions for Sheena about the products that she has developed. <laughs> People are interested to learn more about the, the products she's developed. Yes. For the rest, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I see uh, all the uh, reactions. Yes. Okay. Well, if there are no, no uh, more questions to ask in, in this session, um, we can uh, wrap up today. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the uh, all the uh, presenters and also to all the participants and uh, like I said earlier that you can still post questions and comments in the Padlet and uh, also the presenters are invited to go to Padlet and reply to some of the questions as, as well. Of course it's not, not uh, necessary that you reply to each and every question that there is or comment but um, you can maybe answer, answer some of those. It would be nice to uh, keep the discussion uh, ongoing there as well. Um, so the first day with, uh, with climate change issues, with education issues, with concrete examples of what can be done in schools and on individual level uh, has been very interesting, very nice. And um, we have um, formed a Slack. Uh, Slack is, a, is an application for phones. Uh, you can buy it from the Google store and from um, the I, I store. What is it called? The Apple version of, of the store. Um, not buy it, but uh, you can download it, sorry. Um, and uh, we will post uh, the link to, to joining the Slack. So all students, uh, whether you are participating here as a, as a presenter or as a participant or in the YouTube also, uh, we will post the link in YouTube as well. And as well as the expert, um, expert presenters uh, are welcome to join Slack. So if you want to continue the discussion, uh, you can do that in Slack. And also, uh, after we finish this session today, uh, those who are in Zoom, it is possible for you to stay for half an hour to discuss further if you like. So um, don't, don't close the webinar if you want to continue. So thank you so much for today. And um, tomorrow we will have Circular Economy Day with, again, um, expert lectures and students, uh, students presenting on different points of, of uh, circular economy. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And again, thank you to all the presenters as well as, as all the participants.